Welcome to The Megyn Kelly Show, your home for open, honest, and provocative conversations. Hey everyone, I'm Megyn Kelly. Welcome to The Megyn Kelly Show. We have a packed and great program for you today. In just a bit, we're going to be joined by my pal Ben Shapiro, uh, and we're going to discuss all the ways that the Democrats are now gaslighting Americans into believing... You owe your mask-free face, if you are one of the lucky ones who has that, to President Biden, for to President Biden, because his policies actually made this happen, even though the president's own secretary of education is now saying, not too fast and taking off the masks. So which is it? It apparently uh, had nothing to do with all the hardworking moms and the dads across the nation speaking out or attending school board meetings week after week. No. It's just our fearless leader standing up. Uh, the parents did. They gave him passion speeches to make sure the voices of their children were heard. Now, forget them. F those people. We can apparently thank Joe Biden and the Democrats. They are the ones who get the credit. Ben is fired up about this. I'm fired up about this. So you don't want to miss that conversation. But first, we're going to begin today in Canada, where police in Ottawa are looking at a new way to get protesters to leave investigate them as parents and threaten them with a loss of custody of their children. Ezra Levant is founder of Rebel News, a conservative media outlet in Canada who's been covering all the protests. Uh, He's with us and he was amazing on this last week. Ezra, welcome back. Thanks for having me. All right. So what is what what is this about the children that the police are now questioning the welfare of the children at the protest? Yeah, I mean, this is their latest attempt to scare off the truckers. The first was to call them racist and sexist and every name that sort of ricocheted off them because it's so patently untrue. Then they accused them of violence. There has been no violence. In fact, Ottawa police report that crime is down in downtown Ottawa. The only crime has been committed against the truckers by an Antifa style activist who rammed for them with a car in the city of Winnipeg. So their latest move, well, I should say there's one more move. The police raided these truckers, taking away their diesel without a warrant. It was quite shocking, actually. Armed police went out in mass and seized all the jerry cans. And the reason these truckers need diesel, they're not driving anywhere. They're sleeping in their cabs. So they have to run the trucks to stay warm. It's still pretty cold in Ottawa. So without any search warrant, without any, it's not against the law to have diesel fuel. Police went in and seized thousands of gallons of diesel fuel. That didn't work. Then uh, there was a court hearing to get an injunction, and a judge gave one threw one bone to the to the lockdownists and said the horns shouldn't honk noisily in residential areas. So, frankly, the noisy honking has stopped. There's nothing left there. So they cooked up this new scheme, and it's shocking and terrifying to see. About a quarter of the protesters there are with families, um, mom, dad, kids. There's bouncy castles. It's, it's quite a festival feeling. So the new move is to accuse these parents of recklessly endangering their children and suggesting that child welfare should come. Now, this is outlandish. Again, there's no basis to it. But... In Canada, there's a giant media company larger than all others combined. It's called the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. It gets a billion and a half dollars a year from the government. It's really a state broadcaster. So their new thing is to go truck by truck asking about the child welfare in that vehicle. At the same time, there's moves to get child welfare to sweep in. That would cause the truckers to leave. Of course, no one loves anything more than their own children. It's a low blow. It shows the desperation. And I think it's going to backfire because don't mess with these peaceful protesters, kids. You can call the protesters names, but you try and trump up some reason to take their kids away. That's not going to go over well in Canada. That is next level intimidation nonsense. But it dovetails perfectly with what we're hearing from our left wing press here in America, because they're trying to paint these truckers like they're January 6th, insurrectionists, right? They were hearing that word more and more, insurrectionists, insurrectionists. Grabian, a company over here that does a great job of sound mashups, uh, gives us a sampling of how the American media, apart from independent voices, you know, that are uh, like mine on digital and, and Fox News, which is more conservative, um, 
are covering it, but this is how the, the mainstream press here is covering it. Listen to this nonsense. The police chief is calling it a nationwide insurrection driven by madness. This is kind of our insurrection by air horn moment. It's, I think it's part of the globalization of Trumpism. Canadians know where I stand. There hasn't been as much violence as some had perhaps projected, but that does not necessarily mean that it has been peaceful. Reports of severe vandalism and criminal behavior. The streets are clogged. The honking is incessant and deafening. This pandemic has sucked for all Canadians. Residents that I have spoken to who say they feel terrorized intimidated. Residents say they feel like hostages. Residents in that area say that they are being held hostage, that this freedom has essentially, this freedom convoy, as they call it, has essentially imposed a lockdown on them. Some protesters harassed a soup kitchen. These anti-vaxxers actually took food from the mouths of uh, the homeless. Hum- hungry, yeah. Because they were, they're, they're, they're so put upon. There have not been any violent outbursts. However, horns have been honking for 12 to 21 hours a night. We've heard it called a nationwide mm-hmm. insurrection. <laughs> threat to democracy, uh, an insurrection, sedition. This is a moment for responsible leaders to think carefully about where they stand. Oh, Ezra. Okay, so they're stealing from the homeless. They're taking meals away from the homeless. You tell me, my understanding was maybe there was one person who, who crossed a line there, like one. So now it makes international news as this is their M.O. Yeah, one person went into a soup kitchen and was said, well, this is just for homeless people, and they left. And severe vandalism, that makes me laugh very hard. There's a, there's a statue of um, someone who, who died of cancer. He was a great Canadian hero. And some of the protesters put a Canadian flag on his shoulders like a cape and put a sign in his hand that said freedom. They didn't vandalize it. They didn't tear it down or paint it. They literally put a Canadian flag on him. And maybe, maybe you shouldn't do that, but to call that severe vandalism – None of these things are are true. And like I say, there was a day in court, I think two days ago now, and the judge said, yes, I grant you that those air horns are going on too noisy at night. No more air horns. They, they've limited the air horns. There's a sort of rules there. And you know what? That might even be a reasonable thing to do. But that's it. There was some horn honking to call this sedition, insurrection, <laughs> terrorism, hostage taking. Let me put it this way. A judge doesn't agree. They need to toughen up. That is absurd. You know, like, give me a break. So much honking. I'm sure it's annoying. <laughs> it's not vi- It's not a violent outburst. And that's, honestly, that's, that's our media. They, too, seriously need to toughen up. But meanwhile, um, you've got disturbing videos from what they're doing to the protesters, right? From trying to take the kids, potentially, to stealing the diesel, to this video that's now gone viral of an officer trying to arrest a 79-year-old grandfather, great-grandfather, the the elderly man dropped an F-bomb at the police. That's what we understand. But this video, and to our listeners, you got to look at this on YouTube later and you'll see. It's a little guy. He's wearing like flannel pajama pants. He can't be more than 5'4". He has white hair. He is being manhandled by this cop. They have him in cuffs like he just committed a murder. And they're shoving him into this car as if, it, seriously, he's a, he's a massive threat to public safety. What's going on there? You know what? It, you're right. He's 70. He's not even five feet tall. And they, brut- they, they brutalized him. He had to go to the hospital. He's injured now, actually. I understand he's retained counsel and is going to sue the police. But it was all because... He honked his not not like a honk honk truck honk, but like a meep meep on his car. So the cop said, "Insurrectionists!" And look <laughs> at him. I mean, I he's he's literally a great grandpa. He is less than five. He's they could lift him up with one arm. Yeah, but he's they probably eighty pounds up, they, soaking they, wet. You know what? And and just because he go meep meep in support of the truckers, it's shocking and. And this breaks my heart because I'm I call myself conservative my whole life. I've been very supportive of police. But in Canada, police are the enforcement arm for public health measures, even crazy ones, even extreme ones. And to see police be politicized. I'm sorry, honking your horn, even if it's against the bylaw. Okay, so so give them a ticket to rough them up like that. It's the Ottawa police have been shocking. That was the Ottawa police. They have. They did a 22-part tweet storm that I've never seen any police force in the world do ever, saying they were working with Canada's national spy agencies to get the digital data of every protester to get their 
license and registration and insurance and their banking information and their digital footprint. They tweeted this out again, no search warrant, no, no one charged with anything. The Ottawa police, I think are trying to scare people away by being so abusive. They're trying to get other people not to come. So in fact, the abusiveness, believe it or not, is the point of it. The fact that that video was circulated and that officer has not been suspended or investigated tells me that Ottawa police are happy with that going out there Mm -hmm. because maybe it'll deter another thousand people from coming to the protest. People say, oh, I don't want to be roughed up like that. Maybe when people see the video of the CBC government journalists going around uh, doing their child welfare questions, maybe that'll cause a thousand other families to say, oh, we'd better not go to the protest. So the, the brutality of it, I think, is the political point. They're trying to shock and scare people away from completely peaceful protests. Right, right. If, if they're, well, one of their biggest beefs is they put a cape on a statue. They could, they could take a lesson from BLM. Honestly, like they they threw yeah. blood over statues of Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. I mean, they went nuts. That's what real van- vandalism looks like. Um, yeah. But what so can we just talk about the set me straight on the locations? Ottawa, that's the nation's capital. That, is that ground mm-hmm. zero right now for all of this still? Well, it's it's the biggest one. It's the most dramatic one. And of course, it being our capital city, it has the most politicians and media. So it certainly had the center of the action. There's two other ones I'd like to mention very quickly. Mm. One is at the Montana-Alberta border, the little town called Coots. Now, that's not a very big border crossing, but there are about 500 truckers and now farmers on the Canadian side who have shut the border down. So the Mounties have made a perimeter around the, the border crossing a couple of miles away. So there's it's like a siege wall. Yeah, so we're the showing RCMP, video of it now. Yeah, and you can't. So you the can't Mounties, there's no way somebody could drive down this this road right now. Not a chance. No, and and frankly, good luck trying to tow those things. Some of those are extremely big rigs. And one amazing thing I'm seeing across Canada is tow truck companies simply refusing to accept the offer to tow these away. I think it's sort of a. It's almost like we're at a general strike. But let me tell you the most interesting and potentially um, eventful blockade in the whole country. And that is at the ambassador bridge between Detroit and Windsor. As you know, there's auto manufacturers on both sides of the border. This one bridge every day, probably a hundred million dollars worth of commerce is done on this bridge. It's about a quarter of all Canada, US trade. A lot of the plants, GM, Ford, et cetera, are, are located on both sides of the bridge. So they need this bridge and the truckers have blocked this bridge. So all of a sudden, this protest, which was a very Canada-centric thing, well, now it's affecting America. And I don't think, I mean, I'll let you do the analysis on the American side, but I'm guessing Joe Biden doesn't want to see copycat protests around America, solidarity protests around America. Mm-hmm. And, and I saw that your uh, presidential spokesman, Jen Psaki, was actually using deferential language, uh, respectful language. That's the interesting thing. You saw Justin Trudeau smear, slander, attack, name call. Very interesting to me to see how the Biden administration has so far not gone in aggressively, but rather with an open hand. I'm not saying they're handling they perfectly. They can't. Oh, my. I mean, Ezra, after the way they backed the BLM protests, it, there is no chance that they can come down on this. I mean, the, it would just be so grossly hip, hip, hypocritical, even for them. I just I think even they don't have the guts for that. Well, more than that, they don't want this to become a supply chain issue in the United States. They don't want it to become an economic issue. If you start impacting the big three, the, the Detroit automakers, then that's going to have a, an economic impact, a real mm. impact. And it really has taken on the style of a general strike in Canada. You've got farmers. I hear now that bus drivers in the city of Hamilton are now uh, taking action. So it's spreading among the working class, which is fascinating. Canada has overtly socialist political parties that claim to talk for the working men. They are demonizing this workers' rebellion. It's the most legitimate, authentic, organic wildcat strike, really, in in probably a century in Canada. And what's amazing is the parties of the left who used to stand with the workers against the big corporations, who used to talk about my body, my choice against medical procedures they didn't want, who used to be skeptical of big pharma, uh, who who wanted personal privacy. The parties of the left have vanished. 
And so this trucker rebellion doesn't just appeal to conservatives. In fact, 57 percent of Green Party members in Canada, Green Party, say they see themselves represented in this convoy. So it's it's organic. It's authentic. It's not led by a super PAC or a political party. And it is a tidal wave watching washing over Canadian politics. My advice to my American friends is if you want to, I mean, you better solve these problems before it washes into your country. Because imagine if there was a, a workers' rebellion in America against these lockdowns, mandates, vaccine mandates. You saw a little bit of that with the airlines in America, pilots calling in sick en masse, a sort of a work to rule move when pilots and flight attendants had to have vaxes. Imagine if the, the good old American trucker went on strike. Oh, over they, vaccine rules and lockdowns, yes. it would hurt everyone. That's right. Well, and of course, they too have been subjected to these mandates. Truckers, I mean, it's one of the most isolated jobs in the world. I was talking about it with my assistant, Abby. Like, what else? Like a uh, snowplow driver, you know, like uh, the guy yeah. the guy who does like the mountain, you know, who, who runs, who does the grooming on the mountain overnight. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can think right. of a few professions where you're alone all day for the most part, like these guys, they just don't want to be harassed. And they're treated by Trudeau. Uh, as these stupid rubes who just don't understand what's good for them. And even Jen Psaki, when in her messaging, she was asked about it on Tuesday. And she said, look, vaccine requirements have been implemented with no disruptions. She said, we know our requirements work. They work. And um when somebody asked her about the possibility that we could see a similar protest here, including on March 1st, this is when Joe Biden delayed his State of the Union to, she was like, well, I'm just going to have to check with our team on security preparations for that. But she's back on the wise up truckers. Our requirements work. And so did Justin Trudeau's. And when we tell you what's good for you is to get a vaccine and we mandate it, you should really just be saying thank you. You know, I've been looking at this uh, amazing protest blockade in the Alberta, Montana border crossing, and the police tried to move on the truckers, but the truckers did not move away. And the farmers came out, the local farmers came out. And it goes back to the principles of modern policing that were outlined by Sir Robert Peel about 200 years ago in Britain. And I can sum it up this way. Modern policing in a liberal democracy only works with the consent of the people. If you're in a police state like North Korea, you can do whatever you want. But in Canada, the United States, Great Britain, Australia, you generally have to have the people on side or it's not going to work. So you had, I don't know, 20 Mounties try to take on 500 big burly truckers. The truckers held the line and and the, the Mounties ran away. And seriously, unless they're willing to do violence to these peaceful truckers, There is a standoff here. There is a crisis in confidence in lockdownism. And you can already see changes. The leader of Canada's conservative opposition was thrown out because he wasn't receptive enough to the truckers. Last night, the premier of Alberta uh, rescinded his vaccine passport. He still is allowing private vaccine passports, but he's ended his. The province of Saskatchewan is ending theirs. So these truckers are are like a mighty tidal wave. And they're they're stymieing the Mounties and other police. But politicians had either better get paddling or they're going to be washed over. And it's amazing. You know, in 1984, the book by George Orwell, there's this one line. If there's any hope, it lies with the proles, the proletariat, the working class. And that's coming true. There's some ideas that are so dumb, only a Ph.D. would believe them, like (laughs) a trucker needs a vaccine mandate. Yeah. I mean, what what's next? Lighthouse keepers. You know, it doesn't make any sense. These truckers kept us going when everyone else was scared. In those early days, everyone was scared. The truckers were not scared. Or maybe they were scared, but they managed their fear. And now we're punishing them. So get get out of the way. The the working classes are saving us. But the problem and the reason Trudeau won't meet with them and the reason why, you know, they're trying still to steal the diesel and make it go away is because the citizenry of of Canada is very left leaning. And most of the not all, but uh, but most of the people who are, are being listened to there sound like this young woman whose uh, soundbite we pulled. I'm not sure where we got this from. Debbie will tell me. But she seems to be more representative of the folks on the street. Oh, she's from, I think she's from Ottawa. Okay, listen. A lot of the citizens of Ottawa and Centertown feel that they can't even leave their home safely. I feel lucky enough that I can leave and go get coffee and go to the drugstore right now. Oh, they just don't understand like the impact that this is having on people here, I guess. You're visibly shaking. Your body is shaking. You are yeah. crying. Well, why is that? 
Well, it's been a week of constant honking, constant hate in social media, walking just down the street. It's hate. People are being harassed for wearing masks. It's just, it's upsetting. It's just, it's emotionally draining right now being here and, and not agreeing with them. Okay, first of all, you don't need to wear a mask outside. I mean, even America, even in the blue states, which are crazy, we got rid of that a long time ago, sweetheart. Take that mask off your face when you're outside. You don't get COVID outside. Okay, number one. And that's why maybe you should listen. When pe- Not to harass her, but when people are saying, take the mask off, you don't need- Maybe you should listen. Try listening. Get Justin Trudeau to try listening to the truckers who are making very valid points. Not all of them, not, but as a group, they don't want to be subjected to a vaccine mandate that that doesn't effectively let them cross over the U.S. border and then back into Canada. That's essentially the, the place they're in. And she is treating honking <laughs> as if she's a she's a shut in. She can't leave her house. Meanwhile, she's like, oh, I can go to the drugstore and I can get coffee. But there are the people and they're honking. They're honking, Ezra. You know what? I, I, I can imagine honking being irritating. And I should tell you that that's that's done now. The judge did grant an anti-honking court order. <laughs> and so if that was what I think people are. are I have no sympathy for the honking. I, I spent the last yeah. 17 years in Manhattan. That is called life yeah. in a big city for yeah. us. But OK, exactly. And, and, and by the way, if you're sampling people right downtown Ottawa, there's a good chance that she may be a political staffer, a lobbyist like the, the truckers are right near Parliament Hill. They're not in suburban areas. So I don't know who that young lady was. And I hope she feels better. But by the way. <laughs> Ottawa has been locked down by the government for most of the past two years. The province of Quebec, eight and a half million people, had a curfew from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m. So what she says, I I go out for coffee. You weren't allowed to go out for coffee in Quebec from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. You were if you were on the streets, police would arrest you. Sick or healthy, vaxxed or not, um, they treated everyone like children or like criminals. So I'm I'm very glad that these people have found their sensitivity now over a few days of honking. But where were they about two years of <laughs> right. some of the harshest lockdowns in the world? Your freedom. These truckers. Yeah, I want to say this. I mean, yes, Canada is a left-leaning country. I, I know that more than most as a rare conservative up here. But this has smashed party lines. Like I say, if you were a green person who didn't, or a skeptic of big corporations or, or government censorship, like those are all things that people on the left believe in too. And in Canada, such a large number of truckers are South Asian, they're, they're Sikh or other minorities. So, so these are people who traditionally might have voted for the parties of the left. This trucker rebellion genuinely cro- cuts across all parties. Yeah. I have seen so many people who used to be sort of natural health people, you know, a little bit age of Aquarius types, people who would never <laughs> vote right wing in their life. They feel like their parties have abandoned them and they'll they'll side with anyone who will just keep the government, keep your laws off my body. Is yep. Those people are now with the truckers. It's topsy turvy. It's amazing to watch. It's the trucker spring. Yeah, the trucker spring. Well said. Well, we're seeing it here, too. Um, More blue state voters getting red pilled by the minute. That's why the mask mandates are coming down fast over here. And I hope you see the same on the mandates up there. Ezra, we'll check back in with you uh, as this thing is not over, not by a long shot. Coming up, the latest on those mask mandates in New York State, uh, our governor, Hochul, she just held a presser this morning. uh, And we're very happy to have GOP candidate for Governor Rob Astorino with us. He's the guy who foiled that video of uh, the Biden administration flying migrants into Westchester County, New York in the dead of night. Right. Remember that? He got all that. Anyway, we'll talk to him about where that's going and what what are the lies he says the Biden administration is telling about this. Are you tired of feeling like someone's always watching you on the Internet? Maybe advertisers know a little bit too much about you. It's freaky, isn't it? Or you're concerned about the privacy of your identity? Using incognito mode will not solve the problem either. IP Vanish VPN will. They are here to protect your right to privacy and help you stay anonymous online. IP Vanish helps you safely browse the internet without exposing your private details to third parties like hackers, uh, your ISP, or advertisers, right? They all want to know more about you and you might not want them to. You can use IP Vanish on your computers, tablets, phones, even devices like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use IP Vanish, all of your data is encrypted. 
This means that your private details, your passwords, your communications, your browsing history, and more will be completely shielded from falling into the wrong hands. Even your physical location will be hidden. IP Vanish makes you virtually invisible online. It's that simple. IP Vanish is offering an incredible 70% off their yearly plan right now for our listeners with a 30 day money back guarantee. So you can try it, see if you like it. That's just like getting nine months for free. IP Vanish is super easy to use. All you have to do is tap one button and you are instantly protected. Take your privacy back today with a brand rated 4.6 out of 5 on Trustpilot. So go to ipvanish.com forward slash Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, use that promo code Megan and claim your 70% savings. That's ipvanish.com forward slash M-E-G-Y-N. Welcome back to the Megan Kelly Show. New York Governor Demi, uh, Democrat Kathy Hochul just announcing that effective tomorrow, the statewide mask mandate will be lifted for indoor businesses. Oh, thank you, Your Highness. Thank you so much. But forced masking will continue for the children of New York State until at least early March. Rob Astorino is a Republican running against Hochul uh, for the governor's mansion, and he joins me now. Thank you so much for being here, Rob. How are you? I'm good, Megan. I think technically she likes to be called your royal highness, not just your highness. <laughs> OK, I'll, <laughs> I'll make sure I amend that next time. Boy, we thought she'd be better than Andrew Cuomo. We thought wrong. Oh. She loves the lockdown. She loves the masks. She had an out when that trial court said, you know what? You didn't have the authority to issue these mask mandates, so they cannot be enforced. She had an out to just say, you know what? I didn't have the emergency powers. Sorry, New Yorkers. I tried. Nope. She's fighting it tooth and nail in in court. And if I'm not mistaken, Rob, this is a woman who actually wears a necklace that reads vaccinated. Vaxed. Yeah. 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 Vaxed. That's, that's, like the, that's like a MAGA hat for her. <laughs> it's crazy. So, all right, it would be funny if it weren't actually affecting our children day in and day out. And um, what do you make of it now? Her her reluctance, as expressed this morning, it's like, OK, indoor masking, fine for businesses. But those kids, no, not yet. Nope. Yeah, I think you're 100 percent right. She had an out and she just had to say, look, I respect the decision of the courts. I was going to end this mandate anyway. Um, so let's just all kind of get back to normal. And the masks that aren't necessary for kids are coming off. She didn't. She doubled down. Uh, I called her Governor Kathy spiteful on Twitter uh, the other night when she just, again, brushed aside everything. And it's this lust for power. And I think part of it, too, is she's got a Democratic primary. So she is really just focused like a laser on the far left radicals in her party. And you can tell by the polling, you can tell by walking around the streets of Manhattan who uh, loves these mask mandates, who's irrational during this COVID time. Mm. And that's who she's focused on. And so they support all these mandates for vaccinations, lose your job if you don't get vaxxed, mask these kids 24 seven, I think that's really who she's laser focused on and everybody else can go to hell. And so she did have an opportunity. She didn't. She's doubling down and she's not following the science whatsoever. No, it's no. just political theater, political science at this point. We have a picture of her up for again, if you want to check it out on YouTube of her wearing her stupid vaxxed necklace. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> the virtue signaling, like just stop it. Right. And and she won't. She ha she doesn't have much of a choice in terms of getting rid of the mandate on a statewide le level, because now we've seen New Jersey say they're going to do it. Delaware say they're going to do it. Connecticut say they're going to do it. Even Oregon said that they're going to do it. So she yeah. can't she can't be the last woman standing in an election year. But man, is she slow rolling it. And even, you know, my state of Connecticut, I just moved. They're like, oh, yes, no more ma mass for kids as of 228. But only if your local officials say it's OK. So really, they just punted it to the locals. Right. And now it'll depend on the politics city to city. Yep. yep. And school board to school board. And so that that's the wrong way to go about it. It's either right or it's wrong. And in this case, it's completely wrong. It's completely unnecessary for those who say they follow the science. It's been pretty clear now for well over a year. Even the CDC did a study and published it last May that said that there really is no significant difference whatsoever 
in schools that had mask mandates for schools that didn't. Yep. You see worldwide places like Sweden that went during the height of COVID, kids were in school, in their, in their classrooms, no mask, no social distancing, normal lives, no different. And we see the battles in the states, right? Some are more loose and had less lockdowns, no mandates. You know, the free state of Florida is one example. Uh, and he was viciously attacked as death Santis because he dared step out of the out of the box. And he was right. And here in New York, it's like, I think she is going to be the last one standing. If Oregon, for God's sakes, Oregon is lifting these mandates, she is just headstrong in trying to pretend that she's on top of things and she's making an executive decision. Part of being an executive and a leader is admitting that things have changed and and to pivot differently. She's not willing to do that. My daughter, who's 12, my other daughter, who's 17, I have a son who's 18 and college has started. None of them are vaccinated. We as parents feel they don't need to be based on the statistics. Overwhelmingly, they don't need to be. But if parents want to get their kid vaccinated, you know what? That's up to you, mom and dad and your child. But don't force me and don't force my kids in order to be educated in New York to have to get a vaccination. And that's where they're going. So I think she's completely off base. She's totally wrong on the science and data. And yet she's sticking with this. this I got to be honest, Kathy Hochul does not seem very smart to me. I'm sorry. But she doesn't. She, she doesn't seem like the brightest bulb. Um, Open minded to more brightness on her part, but I have yet to see it. Um, it's not it's we're no longer at the point where we can pretend the masking isn't doing harm. More and more parents right. are showing up at the school board meetings and saying this is wrong. It has to stop now. And it's not victimless. There was a man. He was on Twitter. I think it was Michael Brendan Doherty of a National Review who tweeted it out and I, tweeted it out and I retweeted it. Naperville, Illinois, another blue state talking about his child, I think he said she's 10, and talking about how she, I think, because the the full clip didn't, he referenced it, but he wasn't clear, but I think she has a speech impediment. And so can you imagine how hard the masking is for this child? Listen to him. Listen to how the, the damage these mandates have done. I can only name a few people in her life that have harmed her and actively participated in holding her <clears throat> back and stopping her progress. And almost every one of them is in this room tonight. We have seen two years of almost no growth, missed goals, goals removed. My 10-year-old daughter has kept these feelings to herself about how much she desperately wants to take her mask off. When we told her that it may be possible on Monday, she cried tears. This morning, she got up before us and she started singing a song to her dolls about how excited she was that kids were finally going to be able to see her smile, that she was going to be able to see other kids' smiles that kids would be able to understand her and she would stop being picked on because they could not understand her through her mask because her speech has been delayed even more Mm. than her special needs. (sighs) She is a strong girl. But when I heard her do that and I heard the things that she said, it broke me. (laughs) I will never forgive myself for not fighting more. I feel that I have failed her for not fighting more. While you say that there's no lost learning, the vulnerable like my daughter have lost and she won't get these things back. But you have failed them. Time. On behalf of the whole board, thank you for your comments. I'm just going to remind all individuals in this audience and in our overflow rooms need to have on a mask. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, Oh, my God. Oh. You know, I have to say, Megan, I I feel the same as that gentleman. And I know a lot of parents feel the same way. And I'll say something I haven't said to anybody. You know, my daughter, who's 12, uh, she's in middle school. I mean, this is a tough age, right? As you're Mm -hmm. growing up, boy or girl. But she has braces. She, um, She just feels now that this mask is covering up her inefficiencies. Right. I mean, she's 12. So everything is a, a competition about looks and everything else. And she said, you know, I, I almost like wearing the mask now because people won't see my braces and, and um, you know, my pimple here. And and my wife and I had sat with her and said, Ashlyn, this is not the wearing masks is not normal. And you feel feel so much better about yourself and seeing people smile and just being normal again. 
And she understood it. And, and she took a stand the other day, uh, Monday. We said to her, we want you to go to school. You're not going to wear your mask. And if the principal or the teacher says anything to you, you tell them, I'm not wearing my mask anymore. I don't want to. And call my dad or my mom. Mm. So she did. And one other girl did it with her. And it's tough because, you know, these kids shouldn't be in the middle of this from bad decisions by adults. And some of her teachers are really good about it. And some are just the, you know, the, the mask sheriffs. So she went to the principal's office and he called, he called us. And we just said, look, we all know it's not normal. Okay. I've had to miss my daughter's first ever games in, in her high school uniform as a basketball player because we weren't allowed to go in and watch in a big gym because of these idiotic mandates. And I've missed other moments for my kid. And, and she has missed moments in the last two years not being in school. And we've seen, and it's so empirical, the evidence about the remote learning, the distance learning, how bad it has been for kids, especially, especially for kids uh, lower income families, uh, minorities, they are disproportionately hurt. Those in school districts that aren't as good as the top level ones. And we just want freaking normalcy for our kids. We just want to get back to a time where we all can make adult decisions, whether we wear this or not. Um, and, and we're going to do what's best for our kids and not these politicians who are just stuck on their talking points from two years ago. Yeah, it's not March of right. 2020. You it's know, not. It's an interesting point about her insecurities and feeling like, okay, the mask is helping me hide them. She, they, they go away over time on their own because when you're in middle school, when no one's wearing a mask, you see everyone has braces, everyone has <laughs> acne, everyone is going through what I'm going through, and so. Yeah. She's never going to know that until they let them remove these needless, ridiculous face coverings. I mean, I laugh in our schools, I laugh and cry because now they're enforcing the mask mandate. If, if, if it falls below our children's nose, the nostrils, like at all, they get screamed at. They could get something, it's basically like a black ball or a demerit. And if you get five, you have a detention. They get screamed at. And meanwhile, these are cloth masks they're wearing, yeah. which we already know do nothing. But we still have Correct. to put the children through the, through the fear and the theater of if it goes below the nostrils, it's like the it's like the airplane seat. You know, like Ellen DeGeneres does a skit yeah. like it, it's <laughs> it's back one inch uh, die. It's it's yeah, upright, we can't land. live right. right? Wait, yeah, who are we kidding? It's, yeah. it's infuriating. And even now, Window can I say this, Rob, even now, Window we, shade have, up. Right. Yeah. we have Michael Cardona, the secretary of education out there saying not yet. No, I, you know, need to be really cautious. Like, I'm sick of these people who know nothing about public health or care or the, the wide swath of not just coronavirus, but the the full you, we've got it. OK, let, here's Cardoni weighing in. What do you think districts should follow in order to 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 make these decisions and right. whether it's safe or not? You know, again, you know, we listen to the CDC guidance around uh, masking. We know it works. We were at 47 percent of the schools fully open at the beginning of uh, the Biden administration. We're at about 100 percent now uh, because we followed those mitigation strategies and really <clears throat> pleased that the numbers are getting better. But I still uh, say we need to proceed with caution and make sure that our health experts are at the table when we're making decisions. Do you think masks hinder kids learning? You know what hinders kids learning? Being quarantined. Because those are our only two choices. Yeah. Wear the mask right. or quarantined. I don't know if they're lying or if they're just sticking with the script that they that they've been told to stick with. And they don't want to admit that things have changed or that they could have been wrong. But either way, they look like morons now. And, you know, Megan, it's, it's interesting because in our schools and in like CYO basketball and all these public places where these kids are supposed to wear their mask, even adults, a lot of times it's become just everyone's like pretending. So you have this COVID vaccine passport on your phone you're supposed to show. You can show a picture of your grandmother and they're like, OK, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Or these masks are down to, you know, below the nose or on the chin strap. And nobody's saying anything because everyone is realizing now it's just a farce. 
but they, they're still pretending to play by the rules, even though they know it's stupid. So they won't go as far as saying you don't have to wear it, but just like keep it around your ear and somewhere so we can it's pretend a joke. that it's Just pull, pull a Gavin it's a, it's Newsom a is what they're saying. Pull a Gavin Newsom. Yes. Oh, great. I will. Wait, now, when you come back, we're going to squeeze, squeeze in a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk to you about this viral video, uh, the smash and grab that went on a Westchester mall. That's This is your jurisdiction. Um in the Louis Vuitton store. Crazy video. We'll talk about that and the video you got uh, at the Westchester airport of Joe Biden sending migrants up here and then just dispersing them. We don't know where. Uh, that's next. Don't go away. And don't forget, folks, you can find The Megan Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east and the full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. Go there now and subscribe if you would. If you prefer an audio podcast, just subscribe and download wherever you get your podcasts for free. Who doesn't want to look and feel younger? Collagen is the key. By the time we hit middle age, our bodies produce less than half the collagen they did in their 20s. Since collagen makes up our skin, our hair, joints, nails, and bones, the gradual loss of collagen over time is why people look old. Our modern diets are not helping either. As we age, it would take all day to cook and eat the right foods to properly nourish our bodies with enough collagen. BioTrust's ageless multi-collagen protein powders are here to help. They ensure that your body gets what it needs every day to help rebuild collagen. BioTrust's ageless multi-collagen proteins provide you with the five types of collagen needed to support the entire anti-aging process, plus essential amino acids to make it a complete protein. Many other brands in the market only use one or two types of collagen. Now, there's no clumping, and it can be mixed into a hot or cold beverage or soup, etc. No artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, sweeteners, gluten-free, non-GMO, free of hormones, and antibiotics. Try it for yourself. Here's what I would love for you to do. Go to biotrust.com slash MK to get your special offer of up to 51% off today. You will also get free shipping on your order and support from personal health and fitness coaches to work with and share their expertise with you. That's biotrust.com slash MK to get your special offer of up to 51% off. So, Rob, you tweeted out this video this morning. It's gone totally viral of a Westchester mall where the the smash and grab robberies continue. We've seen it a lot in California. Now we're seeing it here in New York. I mean, again, all these soft on crime jurisdictions are, as I said yesterday, canaries in the coal mine for the rest of the country. If you should be so unfortunate as to have George Soros fund the election of your D.A. Um, So the video is crazy. It shows these guys going into Louis Vuitton in the mall smashing i guess and grabbing and the the video shows as far as i can see the guard outside of the store doing absolutely nothing the fierce employees in the store are fighting if i were if i were the owner of this store in this product line i'd be giving all those employees a raise and then apparently they left and they went to another store in the mall and did it again Different days, but yeah, they hit the Burberry store, they hit Louis Vuitton, and they hit another one uh, late at night over the last month in the Westchester Mall in White Plains. That's the mall I go to. That's the mall that families would go to. They would feel safe. They'd walk around, spend time together. And I, I have to tell you, I can't tell you how many people over the last week or so have said to me, they're just not letting their kids go there. They're not going there. They just, and, and what I, You know, Megan, so many people think that it's over there, right? The crime Mm -hmm. is in New York City. I live in Westchester. I live in the suburbs. It's in New York City. Now they're realizing it's not over there. It's everywhere, including in our own neighborhoods, in our own malls, auto thefts in our own driveways, burglaries in our stores. And if we're going to continue down this path of coddling criminals, handcuffing the police, shaming crime victims letting them out immediately, um, emptying the prisons, which is something Kathy Hochul has done, uh, having a parole board that literally releases 24 cop killers in the last two years. That's the Cuomo Hochul record. These are the kind of things that they're not just absurd. They're actually very dangerous. And we're seeing the results of these policies where the Manhattan district attorney says, 
I don't like those crimes. I'm not going to I'm not going to prosecute them. You rob a bank with a gun, but you don't really use it. Yeah, it would be petty larceny. These emboldened criminals to do what they did at the Westchester. If people want to see that video, go on at Rob Astorino on Twitter or Facebook or Rob and and you'll see it. And it's so brazen but it really is putting us all in jeopardy. You know, I was at the the funeral for the NYPD officers. I was at St. Mm. Patrick's Cathedral. Oh. And it was it was so gut-wrenching to to obviously to be there and emotional. And when one of the family members was directly talking to the politicians like Kathy Hochul and Schumer and all these other soft on crime radicals, she was pleading with them among her tears to just fix these crimes you know, the, these laws go after the criminals and and stop this nonsense. And then you'd have the hypocrites like Kathy Hochul politely applause. And then she went outside. And when the press asked her about the no cash bail, whether she would revoke it, she said, no, uh, I think, you know, the law is working the way it should. And um, yeah, it's just it's it's like head in the sand nonsense. But again, it's just it's the radicalism that has taken hold in New York City and in New York State and across the country with these AOCs that they're so afraid of instead of standing up to them. Yep. And who, we, uh, who bears the so problem? It's normal people. Two things. There's a headline in the Daily Mail today out of Seattle showing it's very disturbing. Um, a, a suspect, 31 years old, uh, arrested after just out of nowhere coming up with a baseball bat and I mean, swinging like he was swinging for a home run, um, mm. knocking, cracking the skull of this innocent woman who was walking down the street. He had been committed 26 times. Um, robbery, theft, domestic violence, roaming the streets. We're seeing it in city after city. Innocent people are being hurt. We actually do have the smash and grab uh, robbery video. We'll show you part of it for the folks who are going to watch on YouTube. But you, you get something out of listening to it here, too. Here it is. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. It's amazing to think of parents walking through the mall with their kids, you know, trying to get like a, you know, a treat, a funnel cake, and they have to deal with that. And honestly, Rob, you, you were the one who called attention, you, the New York Post, um, to what's happening at the Westchester Airport with the, Joe Biden's migrant caravan, basically. He, the, the White House says, oh, we're, it's only minors. We have to find minors' homes. That's why we sent them. And it wasn't the dead of night. Peter Ducey said, well, it's 2, 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. What, you know, what would you call that? Um, and they say now, Rob, it's OK because they do have to find homes for minors. And that's all they sent. What say you? First of all, they, they have completely lied and deflected. And, and naturally, when I exposed all this and, and asked questions, basic questions like, OK, even even if it is just unaccompanied children, and I know that's not the case, what schools are they going to? Are they vaccinated? Have we done background checks? These aren't just little six-year-olds with backpacks. These are young adults. These are boys 17, 18 years old as well. And what's the scoop? Tell us. I mean, this is a public safety issue, a public health issue, the public's right to know. You're sending them from the southern border, and you're literally taking that crisis and moving it now to the entire interior of the country. So now every community is a border community. And we don't have a right to know. And, you know, they scream, you're a racist, you're you're a bigot, you're a xenophobe. That's all they know how to do. But they won't answer the questions. And so we kept showing up and asking. And then I got this video from Westchester County Police, which I foiled. And it's I mean, it is an eye opener. It's in the in the middle of the night. These planes are unloading and the police officer asked these these contractors like, hey, what's going on here? And and candidly, they're like, we do this in the middle of the night so nobody finds out. This is supposed to be on the down low, the hush hush, because if people did find out, the media found out, people would be upset and this would be a betrayal of the American people. So it's just everything is completely and utterly broken down in our country, right? There's no normalcy anymore. There's no respect for laws or or people. And it's just upside down. And so I and others are, are getting off the couch and and fighting back to save our sovereignty, to to save our laws, to save our country.
All right, do me a favor, 15 seconds or less. What say you to Andrew Cuomo, who now says he never should have resigned? He claims he's been <laughs> exonerated because no one's chosen to bring criminal charges against him uh, and that he's done nothing wrong. And he and he might a, he might run again. He might run again. Yeah. Oh, please do. You're a thug. Uh, you should never, ever have been um, exonerated of these. Janice Dean, God bless her for bringing up all these issues with yes. the COVID nursing home deaths and, and many others. And just try it, uh, because I think New Yorkers are fed up with your nonsense as well. Exactly. And of course, he hasn't been exonerated. It's just because they can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt doesn't mean you didn't do it. You know, I mean, it's it's absurd. Um, Anyway, Rob, very interesting to watch. I know your main competition is Lee Zeldin. Um, At this point, I think a lot of New Yorkers would take anybody who had an R after their name. Uh, But we'll find out. He's a very blue state, lived in it my whole life until the last couple months. And... uh, We'll we'll see. We'll love the to check back name. in with you as time goes on. All right. Uh, don't don't miss our next segment because Ben Shapiro's here. He's got a new movie coming out this week, and we'll talk to him about Rochelle Walensky too. From the first moment I sat in my ex chair, my body said yes. This is what a real office chair is supposed to feel like. I never actually look forward to sitting in my office chair. Who does? Till I got my ex chair. Can your current office chair give you a massage? While you're working, no, normally you have to pay for that, but the X chair can. Can your office chair heat up or cool down? Not unless it's an X chair. It's all in the LMX massage and temperature regulation, exclusively designed and made for X chair. And once you feel the customized support of X chair's patented dynamic variable lumbar, your back is never going to be happy in any other chair again. High performance, quality engineering, extreme comfort. Those are some of the reasons I love my X chair. Now I can't wait to be at work. And sometimes, even if I'm not working, I just sit in my X chair to get that special feeling. Take my advice and try X chair for yourself, risk free for 30 days. Once you realize how much better your chair should be treating you, you will never go back. I promise you. Go to xchairmk.com now. That's the letter X, chairmk.com. Or just call 1 844 4X chair for 100 bucks off your order. X chair has a 30 day guarantee of complete comfort and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month. Xchairmk.com. Welcome back to the Megan Kelly show. Joining me now, Ben Shapiro, editor emeritus of dailywire.com, host of the Ben Shapiro show and executive producer of the daily wires latest film shut in. Hello, emeritus. What's going on, Ben? How are you doing? Good. Congrats on the film. I watched it. My team was like, we'll watch it for you if you want. I'm like, no, I actually want to see it. I want to see how, how it is. I really enjoyed it. It's a thriller. It's a good thriller. It keeps you on the edge of your sh- seat. You don't know what's ha- going to happen to this poor woman. And the, the acting was actually amazing, especially the I thought the child actors were kind of crazy good. Yeah, uh, the, the kids were actually shockingly good. When, when we read the script, we were, we were taken aback at how good the script was. So it's, it, it was on what was called the Hollywood blacklist for years. doesn't mean that no one would produce it. It means that it was considered one of the best scripts in Hollywood that no one had yet produced. And, uh, and when the option came up on it, we grabbed that because obviously it doesn't require a huge budget. We can do it pretty quickly. Uh, and, uh, and it contains a lot of the values that, that we liked. So uh, we, were, we were privileged to make the film and we're really excited to bring it to people and provide a little bit of competition in at least a minor way. Uh, for dollars of people who are sick of getting slapped in the face by Netflix and Apple TV and Hulu and all the rest. Well, this is this is the thing. This is why everybody out there has got to support The Daily Wire in this effort. Watch the movie, uh, all the movies coming from The Daily Wire, because there needs to be somebody who will make more conservative leaning films, hire more conservative leaning actors, which right now is a death knell to your career if you're a, a Hollywood person. And so we always talk about creating new lanes. This is one. So people need to exercise with their money, with their wallet, uh, although they can watch it for free. My listeners can uh, Thursday night. But after that, you got to pay to subscribe to The Daily Wire and support the effort. Well, I definitely appreciate that. And we have all sorts of good stuff coming. We have a movie called Terror on the Prairie with Gina Carano. You remember we picked her up last year after mm-hmm. Disney Plus canceled her for basically nothing. Uh, we, we picked her up and we're doing this great Western. It looks really good. We, we've seen all of the uh, the outs from it and and that's going to be great. That's coming out in the next few months. And we have another movie that, that's going to be kind of a surprise. We have a bunch of stuff that's coming out. So uh, we're hoping for, for folks to support us because if you don't support us, then who's going to make this kind of stuff? Because right. uh, frankly, it's, it, it is amazing how Hollywood is, is so unbelievably one-sided that when you just watch a film that doesn't overtly smack you in the face, you're like, well, that was pleasant. Uh, that, that's how mm-hmm. bad it's become. 
It's so true. You can't turn on your TV. You can't turn on a streaming service. You can't turn on, you know, any sort of Apple TV or movie, whatever, without getting lectured to these days. You've got like the latest cause of the month. It's some, something about identity politics. Then the movie's all about wokeness, somebody's woke battle. You can't avoid it. And yet you've got shows like Yellowstone, which, you know, they didn't start in the cities out and then grow in where they started in the inner city and grew outward that are crushing everything. So there's a market for this. If only people would open their eyes. There's no question. The thing that's irritating about Yellowstone is it started off as a kind of dark Western. Uh, and and then it's as though they got uncomfortable with the fact that it's such a, a kind of congenitally right wing show. Uh, mm-hmm. And so they started making over left wing moves. I don't know if you watched the last season of Yellowstone, but I did. Uh, the last season of Yellowstone has uh, has Kevin Costner who is supposed to be this grizzled rancher, billionaire rancher, who's kind of the hero of the show. And uh, his love interest is a radical environmentalist who's getting yes. arrested for protest. It's, it's really, it's, it's quite absurd. <laughs> you have a good point. My other frustration with movie with uh, the series Yellowstone is they write, the, the, the character played by Kelly Riley is, you know, very interesting, Beth. But they, she's clearly written by a man. I mean, no, like yes. she's only got one sort of mode and it's like the most crass mouth, toughest man ever. And this is clearly a man's version of what a tough woman looks and sounds like. That's exactly right. The worst job in the world is being some sort of low level wage employee working at the front desk of, of any business when Beth Dutton walks in. That's just the worst <laughs> job in the entire world. If you're if you're somebody's assistant, if you're like a waiter, she's just going to come in and abuse you for no reason. And it's pretty clear that Taylor Sheridan, listen, the dude's doing an amazing job in the yeah, sense he's that he's talented. currently writing, I believe, three separate shows on TV simultaneously. And he's got 1883 going in this one, and then he's got Mayor of Easttown. Um, and the, you know, all, all of that is to say that it's pretty obvious that with Yellowstone, he basically has about 30 minutes of material. And then he's like, what if we just have Beth yell at somebody for 30 minutes? I, like, I just, I, I got <laughs> or nothing. I'm going to show the horses. I'm going to show those horses again with their crazy, like, they run and they can stop on a dime. You right? Like, anyway, I still enjoy it. I love it. But yeah, point taken. Oh, yeah. No, um, I'm, I'm like, hate, love watching it. Right? Like, I, like, I really enjoy it. But it's terrible. I mean, like, yeah. it's, like the plot, the last season, I, I did a full 15 minute review of the last season on YouTube. And, and I got to say, the last episode of the last season is one of the most ridiculous things that has ever been committed to film. It is so silly. Mm, um, but it's, it, it's definitely, but uh, honestly, I'll watch, if there are cowboy hats and an occasional gun and horsies, I, I will watch it. Yes. And you know, as you know, we have a place in Montana, so it's like any reason to look at that skyscape and enjoy oh, yeah. the the scenery. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, but it does make me want to be a rancher and I want her more wardrobe. Okay. More importantly, let's come back here to the United States or to the East Coast, um, where Rochelle Walensky resides down in the DC area. And Ben, as the states one by one, the, the blue states are st- starting to say, all right, you can take the mask off. I love how they're like, yes, you can take the mask off in two months, right? They're like, okay, we'll take what we can get, sadly. But uh, Rochelle Walensky, ever the party pooper, comes out and says the following. Here she is. We continue to recommend universal masking in our schools. Um, And so our guidance has not changed. And what I will say is in this current moment, I'm pleased to say that about 96% of our children are in schools and that the masking has allowed them to be in school safely. That and getting our children vaccinated. Oh my God. Shut up. Shut up, Rochelle. I can't stand her. She is the weakest. She's the opposite of Beth Dutton. She is the weakest woman walking. I've never seen somebody so pathetically scared and weak all the time in a leadership position. If if it's up to her or Fauci, they're never coming off. And everyone has to be mandated vaccine two minutes after they're out out of the womb. It's horrifying. I mean, honestly, our public health officials have blown this every way. But but Luce, it's 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 amazing how badly they have blown this. When she says things like what's kept schools open is masks and vaccinations. I have a question. Why is it that schools in Florida have been consistently open for well over a year at this point? Most of them without masks. And when vaccinations were not available for five year olds, by the way, I have three kids, eight, five and and almost two. And none of them are vaccinated because the longitudinal data on vaccinations for kids is really shoddy. And none of them are actually going to get seriously ill. In fact, they all had Omicron and they were all fine because they are children, because children, generally speaking, are fine from this disease. The grand total number of people under the age of 18 who have died from any form of COVID, Omicron, Delta, the original, any of those, for two years is below 800, last time I checked, according to her own agency, the CDC. Okay, that's for two years. More kids have died of pneumonia on a year-by-year basis than have died from COVID in the last couple of years under the age of 18. And yet she's saying that what kept schools open are masks that, by the way, Everyone now understands if they are cloth masks, they are completely useless against Omicron. Right? There were many of us who were shouting this in the wilderness for a while, that, that even the original variant, cloth masks weren't doing very much. And, and maybe if you could make the argument for N95s or something, maybe. 
But then with Delta, there was no good data whatsoever on cloth masks or even surgical masks. Right? The, the study that they like to cite, I believe, is from Malaysia. That, that particular study was done on the original variant, not on Delta, which was twice as transmissible as the original variant. And none of it was done on Omicron, which is 70 times as transmissible as Delta, meaning it's 140 times as transmissible as the original variant. All of this is unbelievably silly. Kids never were capable of wearing these masks properly in the first place. My wife, who, of course, is a doctor, she was trained in the use of personal protective equipment when she was working in a hospital. There's an actual thing you have to do. It's painful, by the way. N95s, if worn properly, are super duper uncomfortable. That is the purpose of them is to be super duper uncomfortable because they create a tight seal around your face. Nobody's been wearing masks properly for a couple of years. And yet we're supposed to believe that my five year old son who's been forced to wear a mask is is like that's what prevented him from from getting sick seriously ill, as opposed to, you know, just being five. The whole thing is insipid and insane. And these people are out of their minds. And what's making, I'm not sure what's making me more crazy. The fact that Rochelle Walensky and Fauci, to a certain extent, are sticking to their let's lock everything down guns, or the fact that Democrats are now realizing the light has dawned upon them, that they need to loosen these restrictions. And then they lie and they say, well, the data just changed. The data never changed. You were just wrong and you were just lying. The data did not change. This attempt to gaslight us into believing that you guys somehow bent the curve when you didn't bend the curve, the, the attempt to gaslight us into believing that the underlying data suddenly were made available to you and that you have been <laughs> attempting this whole time to follow the data as opposed to following your political preferences is maddening. It's maddening. I'm not sure which one of these things is making me more crazy. The people who are yeah. hanging on to this thing, which at least points for consistency, or the people who are reversing themselves because good for the people living under these these tyrants. But don't don't gaslight me and tell yeah. me That all of this is being done because suddenly the data have changed in a couple of weeks before Joe Biden's State of the Union address. And one week after Stacey Abrams got completely destroyed politically for not masking around a bunch of kids who were masked. Mm -hmm. Ben, it's like my primary care physician said to me last week when I said, well, yogurt, yogurt's good. He said, it's a lie. (laughs) Yogurt's a lie. (laughs) And this is a (laughs) lie, too. This the truth has been out there. If only they would open their eyes to it. And they refused because it was a Democratic virtue signal for them from the start. And they wouldn't let go of it. And and a fair amount of these people on the far left have really spun themselves up into hysterics because they love drama. They, they don't have busy enough lives, whatever. They can work it out with their psychiatrist. But sadly, the rest of us have been dragged along with their craziness for far too long. So to your point, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, he tweeted, uh, he was actually, I think he's on camera saying this. Let's, let's listen to him talk about how this is all thanks to Biden, the way that we're taking our foot off the gas now, we're restoring normalcy, and normalcy. Thank God for President Biden. Listen. And the Omicron variant is in retreat. And that's not by accident. That's because under President Biden's leadership, a public health infrastructure was put into place, beginning with the American Rescue Plan without a single Republican vote to ensure that we can do everything possible to crush the virus. And that is what has been happening. Got it? Biden crushed the virus. Ah! (laughs) It's it's, ah! It's so frustrating. (laughs) The the number of lies that came out of his mouth that just spewed from his face hole in, in a row there, it's so, it, it, it's in crazy. It, it, like if there were a word to to describe being made crazy like this, it, it is in crazying. It is, <laughs> what in the world? So here are, the, here are a few of the things that he said that are untrue. One, it is not by accident that the curve has gone down. Oh, really? Is that why the curve has done exactly the same thing on Omicron in every single place it has ever taken uproot? Every single place from Australia to Canada to Britain to France to the United States, from Florida to New York, they all, it all follows the same pattern. Omicron goes like this and then it goes like that. It goes up and then it goes down. And Joe Biden had nothing to do with any of this because he's not alive. He is not capable of doing anything about this. By the way, government everywhere was not capable of stopping on. In New Zealand, they had a spike of Omicron and New Zealand's been shut down. It's like seven people, a hundred hobbits. And a horse, like a small horse from Parks and Recreation, <laughs> they still had an Omicron spike, despite the fact they had nobody coming in or out of the country. OK, so, so first of all, there's that, which is just crazy that we're supposed to believe that it was it was the testing measures that Joe Biden didn't provide that killed yeah, Omicron. Right. OK, so that's in crazy thing. Number one. OK, then him citing the American Rescue Plan as the impetus for defeating covid is so out of his mind insane. Okay, the fact is that that is what helped superheat the inflation that we have seen over the last year. We were supposed to get, we had an artificially depressed economy. Right? We put our economy into a coma at the beginning of Omicron, uh, at the beginning of, of COVID. 
And then we allowed it to recover to a certain extent because we, we took it off life support and we allowed it to, to live once more. And then they passed this stupid American recovery plan, which is $2 trillion of wasteful spending that was injected directly into the economy when Americans had more money in their pocket already from all of the dumb spending in 2020 than they had before the pandemic. And then that was supposed to have been what saved the economy. Hold up a second. Six weeks ago, Joe Biden was telling us that the economy was probably going to tank in December and January for two reasons. One, because of Omicron. And two, because he wasn't going to get his Build Back Better plan. Remember this? Build Back Better yeah. was going to save the economy. Without BBB, we were all going to die. It was, you know, if we hadn't already died of tax cuts and net neutrality, we were going to die of lack of BBB. He didn't get any of that stuff. Omicron hit and BBB wasn't passed. And what happened? Instead, we got a booming economy in January. So here's the new rule. Anytime Joe Biden fails at doing anything, the country is better off. So if something good happened, you can reliably understand that it was not Joe Biden who did it. It was Joe Biden failing that did it. You know, that he's talking about things like mask mandates and the control that they were able to exercise over schools, thanks to, to that rescue plan, where, you know, the schools basically, if they want the federal money, have to do what Rich Rochelle wants when, when it comes to the masking and the mandatory vaccines and so on. And now this thing that's become such a political hot button that half the country is outraged about and growing. It's not just Republicans anymore. He wants to go out there and have a spike the ball in the end zone moment about it all saying, see, it worked. It worked as if the vaccine mandate or the mask mandates got us to the end of Omicron or to the place where the pandemic is endemic and we can just live with it. It's so crazy. OK, the mask, the vax mandates never went into effect for employers. The the mask mandates were never in effect for a huge swath of the country. The mask mandates that were in effect in the Northeast did not prevent an Omicron spike anywhere in the Northeast. I mean, Joe Biden, there, there's only one thing the guy is good for, and that is being wheeled out in front of a parade that's already moving. This is the consistent theme of his presidency from the very first day when he pretended that he was responsible for the creation of vaccines. Right. That that parade was already going. He just kind yep. of wheeled himself out right in front of it. And he said, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. And then and then he did the same thing with vaccine distribution. He used the exact same plan Trump was going to use. He's like, well, oh, oh, I'm here. And, and now he's doing the same thing with Omicron. OK, Omicron has nothing to do with you. You you, you failed. Your own administration admits that you were supposed to get all these at home tests available. None of that happened by the time you mobilized. The at-home tests are available like now when we're on the other side of the spike. It's just the gaslighting is what drives me totally crazy. If they were just yeah. honest, they can't be. But if they were just honest and they said, listen, you know, we did the best we could. We tried to follow the data, but we got carried away and we, we, we wanted to be more cautious. And, and our caution may have let us down into some some bad kind of box canyons here. But we did our best. I think the American people would be a little bit more forgiving than they're going to be forgiving in, in 2022. This is not getting forgotten. No yeah. one in America is going to forget that these schmucks made kids mask up for two years or kept them out of school and forced people out of jobs and destroyed tens of thousands of small businesses. Nobody is going to forget all of that. And if they think they can happy talk their way through their failures of governance for the last couple of years by suggesting that the data have just changed. By the way, when we talk about the data changing, we should note the levels of infection of Omicron right now in the United States, even on the downslope, are way higher than they were at this time last year in terms of diagnosed cases of COVID. And we're at the highest levels of death in the United States from Omicron than we have been for like a year. OK, so so it's not about the changing data. It is about the fact that the American people finally had enough and they can read the writing on the wall and they are hoping to salvage some sort of, of non-complete wipeout in 2022. Well, you know, good luck. Good luck to them. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. Well, I mean, another tactic might be instead of just falling on their swords and saying we got a lot wrong and we're learning and here we go to blame the children themselves. Um, that They're the reason why the masks are on. And that's pretty much what Randy Weingarten did, um, who I think was on NBC. Uh, here's the soundbite. What Dr. McBride just told us about masks not particularly being effective for children, what's the argument against taking off masks in schools? Well, the argument is that you have, well, let me just say this. I am in favor of an off-ramp on masks. Right. The real issue becomes, are, is, the, is, is the spread low enough so that there's no dissemination or transmission in schools? And it's not the teachers transmitting to kids, um, it's more kids and kids, particularly in elementary schools right now. Yogurt. Yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah. lie. I mean, she's just speaking nonsense. She's speaking words that sound like a sentence, but don't actually form an intelligible sentence. It's, it's and, like and when it's you say. And it's largely her fault. It's not the kid's fault. It's not transmission from kid to kid that's that's no, keeping massive. No, it's her By fault. The way, kids have been infecting each it's other. It's her like, fault. Throughout the pandemic. No one cares. The kids are fine. 
Get over it. The kids are fine. You know how many tweets I've seen over the course of the last two years? People saying, I'm just so afraid for my two-year-old. And I keep tweeting back to them. Why are you afraid for your two-year-old? Your two-year-old is safer unvaccinated than you are vaccinated. Right, you're Statistically speaking. Sorry, but you're an idiot. Unless your kid has comorbidities, you have absolutely nothing to worry about when it comes to this your is, two-year-old and COVID. This is correct. This is correct. I mean, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, my, my eight-year-old got Omicron. You know how worried I was? I was this worried, zero worried, because I'm not a moron. Because I follow the data. And you know what? She had a fever for like three days and then she was done. And then all her siblings got it and they were all fine. I mean, like, but, this is this is also insane. Randy Weingarten, here's what Randy Weingarten wants. Teachers to never have to teach again but get paid. This is what yes, she wants. Because the that, AFT right. does not care about students. They don't care about students. I will say the one thing that has been kind of fun to watch over the last couple of years is the complete unmasking of everybody. Now, yes. it, it, Megan, you've been in this business forever. I've been in this business for a very long time at this point, a couple of decades. And it, most of politics was sort of shielded from us for a very long time where you felt like, OK, I kind of know what their agenda is, but the agenda is it can be shaded and it's kind of nuanced. It's not so clear. Now the agenda is just right out there. Randy Weingarten can't cite a single piece of data for why kids should remain masked. And she's like, well, they should remain masked anyway until transmission is zero, until there's <laughs> no transmission, which, of course, will never happen because this thing is endemic. There's only one thing she wants. It's she wants her teachers to get paid a lot of money to do nothing. And then she wants to get paid a lot of money to do nothing. And then she wants to funnel money to her favorite politicians to pay her to do nothing. That is the game. She has been exposed in a unique and fun way. I, I do have a tip, though. Maybe your wife can can use this because, um, you know, the mask, She your wife shouldn't have to deal with that N95, those marks on her face at the end of a long day. There are other ways. And thankfully, Ben, the good people at Cambridge University have spent their time not let's get to the bottom of whether, you know, we should be masking children or whether there's myocarditis caused by, you know, the vaccines in some young men. No, they've decided to figure out what if we put pantyhose over the masks and then put rubber bands on other masks and how can we make them even more effective and um we're putting a picture on the board for people who watch it on youtube it's absolutely absurd i think if you put pantyhose over your mask you're a pervert <laughs> that's that's what you that's what we've determined you might need a little i don't know you might be going into um therapy soon um but they did find that pantyhose and cloth tape were the most effective at improving how well your KN95 mask fits. OK, so it's not enough to just put the KN95. Then you put pantyhose over it with, and you tape it to your face, too. And it, it, just a couple of items. The most effective tactic was to wrap the pantyhose around the bottom half of the face on top of a mask. This, the scientist said, could reduce the number of viral particles by up to seven times more than a loose mask on its own by sealing the gaps around the nose and the mouth. Um, other methods included tying the ear bands to make the masks fit even more tightly or stuffing the gaps of your mask with bandages. <laughs> with bandages. <laughs> they go on to say at the end, however... The researchers did note that many of the, quote, hacks, uh, including the most effective ones, were uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, who would who would have thought? And here I thought that the height of comfort was an N95 adumbrated with a, with bandages and a pantyhose. <laughs> uh, that, that, wow. If only, I'm glad they told us that it was uncomfortable. Otherwise, I would have thought that the study really was was kind of full of it. Um, listen, I've been recommending for a couple of years that if you want to ensure 100 percent you don't die of COVID, all you really have to do is take a plastic bag, put it over your head and then take some duct tape and wrap it around your neck and you will not die of COVID. <laughs> you won't. I mean, I can't I can't make any other guarantees. But th this exactly whole thing, right. can I can I just point out how, what kind of idiotic studies we have funded during this pandemic as opposed to the ones that actually matter? So here yeah. in the United States, We've done there was nothing. really only one led. question that mattered very early on. OK, really only one. What is the infection fatality rate? Namely, if you get infected, what are your chances of dying? Right, based on age, based on prior health condition. We still don't have any numbers on that because all of the powerful scientific institutions in the United States decided that they would rather do dumb studies about how effective a mask was if you taped it to a mannequin than how many people had actually gotten the original strain versus how many people had died of the original strain. It was left to private industry to do ser serotology tests so or serology tests to, to look for antibodies in the blood of general populations in like Santa Clarita. Why didn't the government know that? Why didn't the government research that? Why was it left to some rando scientists doing some study in Malaysia to figure out whether there were any comparable studies about whether masks were effective or not? They just kind of said stuff. And then they knew that if they said it over and over again, and if they used big tech to shut everybody down, then they could get away with nearly anything. And it, I have to say, it is incredible to watch in real time as all of these people come around to the fact that all the stuff that they labeled misinformation is now true. Right, from the mm -hmm. Wuhan lab leak to maybe it's true that there were a bunch of people who are in the hospital with COVID, but not of COVID. I mean, right. Th this is something that the Biden administration is now attempting because they have to 
They have That's to sort right. of get those statistics down. So now they're like, well, what if we went to the hospitals and found out how many people have died with COVID as opposed to of COVID? Oh, because you mean now the it's question we weren't allowed to ask last year? And yeah, the year before that, that question? Be, like, because now he, he knows what's going to happen to him at the polls. So now he's got a political interest in actually getting to the bottom of what the real numbers are. But before, he was perfectly happy to live in imaginary land because he wanted to criticize Trump, because he wanted to prove that Death Santis was killing people and he was the responsible one. And now that he knows he and other Democrats are going to pay, they're going to pay in November of 2022, they actually want to get to the bottom of the numbers. And then when the numbers are, are better, because once we separate with COVID from, from COVID and terms of the deaths, he's going to say that's because of me. We're going to get more Hakeem Jeffries out there saying, you know, we crushed the virus, crushed it. Thank you. You're welcome. And th- th- that's exactly right. And and it's it's really irritating. Again, I don't think that it's going to work. I think that they're relying on the idea that perhaps the, the economy is going to go into a natural recovery. Honestly, the best thing that, that has happened to Joe Biden and his and his administration is Joe Manchin. It is the best thing that has happened to him because Joe Manchin has stifled a lot of his most idiotic plans. Mm. And that's the only thing that's allowed the economy to continue to grow at a rapid pace. Now, if Joe Biden actually got his way, he would be in serious, serious trouble come 2022. Now, listen, I think he's going to pay a price anyway. But I think that basically their hope, Politico said this the other day, they are basically hoping that if they just focus in on a growing economy and we've all gotten back to normal, maybe in six months or seven months, we'll all have forgotten about the last two years of misery that people have been suffering. But I don't think that that is correct. I don't think that that's how people operate, that they're just, you know, how I feel today is how I'm going to vote. By the way, because if that were true, I think Trump would have won re-election, frankly. Mm. The, the fact of of... You know, my pocketbook, pocketbooks are not the only thing that people are thinking about in the moment when they vote. They're also thinking about the fact that how did my life change over the last few years and whose fault was that? I mean, I think differently about politics. I've been right wing the whole time, but I mean, I have to think differently about the last two years and the materialization of all the bad effects of Democratic policy, considering I literally picked up my company and moved it to Nashville and took my family and moved it from California to Florida. That was so brilliant of you. I, I, I've been, I love your podcast. Of course, I listen to it all the time. And Ben has been like, he's been especially funny and good on um, the subject of Whoopi Goldberg, the subject of Joe Rogan. The, the, the thing on Whoopi was the greatest thing ever. The, the headline of the Daily Wire of your episode was um, Whoopi Goldberg says everyone is racist except for Hitler. <laughs> so we'll, I got to ask you about her and Joe Rogan. And I really want to talk to you about the mourn fest going on over there at CNN right now. These anchors every day weighing in on oh, this is traumatic. Alison Camerata, like literally suggesting that her mental health has been affected and that the company needs to help her. I mean, I can't, we're going to pick it up with all that. Squeeze in a quick break. Ben, let's talk about the morning over at CNN, M-O-U-R-N, morning. Um, They are in denial that Jeff Zucker has been kicked out. He was about to get fired, so he resigned uh, in the wake of it being exposed that he had a consensual affair with an underling, with with an employee. And um, they claim that it only started during COVID. I've said reportedly, I've said on the air before, uh, that's not true, that 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 I've heard from many people well before COVID that these two have been having an affair. We had a reporter from Rolling Stone come on our air and say her sources are telling her it started in 1996, been going on for years while they were married, while she was a very junior employee to him at the Today Show. He kept promoting her up the line, continued to do that while at CNN over the heads of other women uh, in the PR department who were not sleeping with him, we presume. And uh, so it's a major ethical breach and it's a major problem for journalism. Um, And I think they were absolutely right to fire the guy. So the CNN employees, and it's conveniently, I think, all the employees who owe their jobs and their careers to him, who realize that there is not another company that will hire them if the new management coming in doesn't like them, are, I mean, they're crying in their soup and, and very openly. And we are hearing ridiculous things like this. Alison Camerata, in a leaked, a leaked tape of their meetings that they're having with uh, the chief there, Jason Keelar, who's the guy who forced out Zucker. I think that what you're hearing, what we're all experiencing, is just a huge shockwave to all of our mental health This has been incredibly destabilizing and unsettling. One of the secrets to mental health is understanding. And the way that happens is getting some answers and some closure. And we don't have that. We don't understand why the death penalty was necessary. And then you've got uh, another employee there offering this up, Ben, telling Jason Keelar, a member of the January 6th committee came forward and told me that the committee is devastated for our democracy as a result of Jeff Zucker's departure. (laughs) What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, so first of all, apparently he was having an affair with this woman since I was 12. So that's a a super long time because I'm 38 now. 
Uh, and so when he says that he was doing this for like the last year, that's that's a pretty weak cover. Uh, he yeah. elevated her at every job she ever held. Uh, she followed him around to every job he ever held. Uh, and then they were apparently coordinating with Andrew Cuomo, which is, of course, the cabra on this whole thing. They were coordinating with Andrew Cuomo, for whom she had once worked as a comms director uh, at the beginning of the pandemic to help kind of fend off Trump and and help him message. Meanwhile, they were having Chris Cuomo do so- spots on air with his brother, the whole Smothers Brothers routine that we all grimaced over during the during the early months of the pandemic. So yeah, did he deserve to lose his job? Of course he deserved to lose his job. But I mean, this is the reality. Most people at CNN, on the basis of ratings, deserve to lose their jobs. And the, the ratings at CNN are lower than than dirt. I mean, th- that more people watch their wallpaper than watch CNN. And it is yeah. not close. CNN's ratings are just garbage. In this part, Trump was right about. And the fact They've that Jeff 90% Zucker percent of their has audience failed, year to year. 90. It, yeah, it, it's crazy. I mean, Je- Jeff Zucker has been a failure at every job he has ever held since the Today Show. He did well on the Today Show, and then he was a giant failure when he was head of NBC. He destroyed their comedy routines. He, he, he then proceeded to move on to CNN, where he completely destroyed their lineup. He turned them from the most trusted name in news to Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo and a, a much less newsy Anderson Cooper, and this yeah. was their evening lineup. And, and yet all these people are, are weeping over him. Now, I just would want to know, what is their actual standard at CNN? So, I mean, it is good to know that you don't get fired if you are if you are having Woody Allen style sex with yourself uh, on camera, like Jeff Tubin. Like that's <laughs> hey, no okay. Problem. No uh, problem. So you can still have a job there. So the good news is Tubin could theoretically be the new head of CNN. And uh, <laughs> apparently it takes you actually being exposed as an advisor to your brother to get fired if you're Chris Cuomo. But then they will mourn you, even if you were nailing the help for like 30 years and elevating her to every position while coordinating with somebody you are covering. And by the way, getting Chris, like, Jeff Zucker let Chris Cuomo go over the revelations that he was working with Andrew. Mm-hmm. Like, how did he think that was going to go, Jeff Zucker? Seriously, like, how do you so think crazy. that was going to go? I assume that Chris has had conversations with Andrew. I mean, considering they have the whole time. Mm-hmm. So wouldn't it ever have occurred to Jeff Zucker, wait, if I fire Chris Cuomo, isn't Chris just going to talk to Andrew, who's going to refer Chris back to Allison Gollist and me? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, exactly right. They're, they're all morons. They're all morons, and they deserve everything they get. Yeah. And, and the worst is Brian Stelter out there saying, like, oh he's attacking Joe Rogan, saying, I don't, you know, like what we do, what people listen to him for information. And it's really disinformation. CNN, see, we are real journalists and we have legitimate stories. Look at our website. We have 80 stories just posted today. And, and to compare us, like people should be coming to us for the real information, not Joe Rogan. It, he, he, he's completely lost the thread. He doesn't understand. We've all moved on without them. We no but longer that, that trust That mentality them. is everything, though. It's that mentality, though, Megan. You know, that mentality that says, why aren't they listening to us? Right? It can't be. It's, it's the Principal Skinner thing from, from The Simpsons, right? It's not me that's wrong. It must be the children. Well, if, if the idea is that everybody should be watching Brian Stelter, which, again, how, how Brian Stelter ever made it on air <laughs> in a consistent fashion is beyond yeah. me. But He should be it, worried for his job. He should. It's so, so odd. But the, if, if you feel that way, then what you really mean is that people should be restricted from viewing other sources, right? which is what Brian Stelter wants. And Brian Stelter wants Rogan off the air, not because he thinks Rogan is such a terrible source of information, but because people should be watching Brian Stelter. And he wants big tech to crack down on you or crack down on me, uh, crack down on anybody that he doesn't like, because why would people watch our shows? I mean, he's so much more reliable. I mean, he is. I mean, his show is called Reliable Sources. It is the most reliable of all the sources, even according to the name of his own show, that he is reliably titled Reliable Sources. So why exactly would we not rely on him for such sources? To pretend that CNN is anything close to what it used to be is, again, yogurt. It's a lie. It's not true. (laughs) CNN has gone totally opinion even during the day. You watch those hosts, like all the blonde ladies, they've pulled a fox. All the women are blonde now. Um, And they sound just as opinionated as Chris Cuomo did, right? And now you've got the ones who really are worried about their jobs because they can't get a job in another place, like shouting out their reasons. You know, like Brian Stelter, we're journalists and we've towed the line during Trump. Don Lemon literally on the air. I'm a black gay man. I'm a black gay man. Just in case new employers, just in case you forgot, I'm black and I'm gay. You cannot fire me. I mean, it's really kind of fun to watch them try to tread water like keep my head above water no no don't fire me yeah well i'm, I'm really hoping that J- look if jason Killar has any brains at all he'll clean house i mean because right it, it, what exactly would he lose what exactly would he lose i mean like the three people who are watching right now might go down to two temporarily before it goes up to four yeah. I, the, the, there's literally only one direction for them to go and that's up if they get rid of a lot of the talent so-called talent that they have over there so that's what they're all yeah i mean you're right it's it's all self-interest and that's that's really what it comes down to journal yeah. 
journalists were supposed to be about your interests. They're supposed to be about covering the stories you care about in a way that is accessible to you. And instead, it has become all self-interest. It is all about what they care about and what is accessible to them. And that's why nobody trusts them. It's why, by the way, Rogan is successful because Rogan's entire shtick. And I know Joe pretty well. I'm friends with Joe, full disclosure. And, you know, what Joe's thing is, is that Joe is the everyman. Right, Joe approaches every mm-hmm. conversation from the perspective of, I don't understand completely the person I'm talking to. Let me spend three hours asking the common man everyday question as to what they're talking about, what they think. And that's why he's popular, because he's a great stand in for the audience. By the way, like on TV, when you watch a TV show, there's always the one character who's sort of the stand in for the audience, the person who says what the audience is thinking. That's Joe in every one of these, in- these interviews. This is why he's really good at his job, as opposed to what they do on CNN, which is they come in with an agenda. They want particular answers. They're going to badger you until they get those answers, or they're going to badger you because they don't get those answers. That's not what Joe does. That's why Joe is successful. It's why they're failures. Mm-hmm. And so far, Spotify is standing by him, but there's a little, little, little mealy mouth what the, the head of Spotify I'm, I'm, is saying. I don't, I, I can't see that, that Rogan, that, that Joe is going to be a long term player at Spotify. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I just, I don't have faith that the leadership there is going to be able to withstand another barrage of this. I, frankly, I'm surprised. It's, it's Wednesday that, that N word reel came out, what, on Saturday, Friday, Friday afternoon. Yeah. And, um, I, I would be shocked if we get through another week without all of these, you know, dark money, Democrat super PACs not putting out some sort of real with him saying the F word for gay people. Or yeah, from his or it's going to be some like misogyny. They'll, they'll find another. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, I, yeah. I would be shocked if they don't follow up on this because they know they're gaining ground. And really, all it takes for them to, to depose Rogan over there is for them to capture one major music artist. Right. All the people who they've been doing now, it's like Neil Young, it's a bunch of people who who retired before I was born. And so that doesn't matter. But but if they got one Taylor Swift to do it, it would really put Spotify between a rock and a hard place. And, and I think they know that. So I don't think they're going to let up. Charlie Cook of National Review was making a good point um, today or yesterday. And he was saying, look, it, the, the, as for the employees at Spotify who are objecting to Joe Rogan, you know, because the head of Spotify was like, we understand you want your voices to be heard. He was saying, why? We don't No, We don't. We don't care. Why, why do I care what the employees of Spotify have to say? And he was saying, if you choose to work at a place that's essentially a library, right? It's essentially a music library. Um, they've got all sorts of documentation that, that they want to put online, read aloud and so on. They've got tons of podcasters now. Um how do you how do you think it's going to go? You can't say I object to all these various viewpoints, but I'm going to work at a library that has books that deals in information that deals in viewpoints. Right. Like he was saying, you can't have uh, a carpenter who won't work with wood. Right? Like this, this is literally yeah, no, the nature right. of this your is, business. But, you know, what? honestly, I don't even blame the woke interns. I blame the CEO. The CEO's a he's a coward. He's a coward. I mean, I run a company. If my employees came to me and they were like, you know what? We don't like what Matt Walsh, who's one of the hosts over here, what Mash Walsh, Matt Walsh had to say on his show today. And so we want you to deplatform him. I would say, I'm, I'm glad that you have thoughts. Go back to work. And if you don't go back to work, then you can find yourself on the unemployment line. Like, wh- what, what do I care what you have to say? You right. literally work here. <laughs> well, what are you even talking about? Since when did the woke employees become the bosses of these, these billion dollar companies? It's insane. Why is Daniel Eck catering to all of the, the stupid 21 year old interns who think that Spotify is supposed to be a, a, a safe space from Wesleyan. I, I just, I don't understand why all these CEOs are such cowards. They're unbelievable cowards. This would have mm-hmm. ended day one. If they had come to, if they had come to Daniel Eck and they'd said, listen, we are so offended by Joe Rogan and this misinformation stuff. And he had said, you know what, tough deal with it. Like deal with it. You, you don't like what he's saying. We got other shows on here. You can listen to those shows. That would be the end of it. That's the amazing thing about all of this. All it would take is just one iota of courage by these folks, but they are so eager not to be eaten by the mob that they think okay, that if they placate the mob by throwing them bones, that eventually they, they'll be left alone. That's not the way this works. Either you're you assimilated by the Borg or you're destroyed. Let me ask you a tougher question, okay? Because this is what happens. It's not like they, it, some of them amorphously say like, Joe Rogan, disinformation, bad, help me. But you've got like, let's say in the wake of the the tape with the n-word and the planet of the apes thing you've got black employees who come to you and say we're deeply deeply offended which is very plausible right i mean like it wasn't great you know stuff um and we we want him gone we don't understand how the company can continue supporting him so then you're in a trickier situation right because you've got people who are in the targeted group which quote unquote targeted who are coming to you uh, yes nine times out of ten it's not sincere right they're part of the woke brigade and they just want joe rogan canceled for other reasons but not everybody's that way. So then what do you say to that employee? I mean, I think you first have to determine whether the employee is sincere or not, which is always the tough part. But but the answer is still no. I mean, first of all, let's just put it this way. Joe Rogan's been doing this stuff for 20 years. Okay, you're not offended by anything he said 20 years ago. 
No one's ever offended by anything anyone said 20 years ago, ever, ever in history of man. No one has ever been offended by something someone said 20 years ago. You're offended by something that happened today or yesterday. You're not offended by something someone said 20 years ago because I don't have a time machine and neither does anybody else. So if a bunch of people came to me and they're like, you know what? This guy said something truly awful 30 years ago. And I'm really like, I'm just broken up about it today. My answer would be, okay, but it happened 30 years ago. And especially because Rogan, I believe, had said several years ago that he's why he stopped using the N word. He made like a big deal out of it. And, yeah, on and his by own. the way, he issued an apology to like when I talked to Joe about this, one of the things that Joe said is the reason I issued the apology is not because I felt like I was getting blackmailed. I did it because I actually don't like the things that I said, which, mm-hmm. by the way, is appropriate. And if you don't yeah. like the things that you said and you do it as a sincere apology, like, you know, I said some stupid, dumb stuff in the past. I think good on you. Like, that's a good thing for our society. What I have a problem with is the second step. So if those employees came and they said, listen, can we have a conversation with Joe and just talk about it? And Joe was like, yeah, let's do it. That sounds great. And then they have a conversation and Joe says, yeah, that was dumb stuff. I never should have said that. I didn't mean it this way. It was taken this way. And then everybody goes home and they're like, okay, well, I understand him better. Then what's the problem? That's, that's just called living a normal day in America. But if the idea is you have to get rid of him because I'm so deeply offended by something that just got unearthed by, you know, media matters or something that, that happened 20 years ago. Yeah, screw you. I'm not I'm not interested in hearing your perspective at that point, because I don't think I think the mark of sincerity is that you actually wish to change the person's mind. The mark of insincerity is that you wish for them to lose their job without any recourse at all. Yeah, well, I mean, and of course, it's very different from what's happening with Whoopi, where, you know, some of the sort of internal woke brigade at ABC are like, fire her, fire her. And I think what the company decided to do was fig leaf it and say, yes, Mm -hmm. she'll be punished. Yes, we stand with the Jewish people. And you've been making the point that Whoopi, meanwhile, contrary to what she says on the air, it has not been she has not always had the Jewish people's back. That's how she's trying to defend herself. Um, And that, uh, of course, you know, you and I talked about this, but if, if Whoopi were a white man, Man who said something offensive about a different group, a group other than Jews, uh, she her, she would have been gone. But she's got certain oh, yeah. sort of placeholders that will keep her there. And the suspension is a fig leaf. It doesn't really mean anything. We all know it. And she'll go on on her merry way, mostly because of her ideology. Right. Now, so, so here's my rule. My rule is that normally Whoopi Goldberg should not lose her job for something like this. However, if you spend your life trying to get people canceled and then you run afoul of, of the cancel culture, I'm, I'm happy to see you go down at that point. Because you have created this monster and you get to you get to get in bed with that monster. Like, that's the way that that works. If you want to change your standards and now you want to say, listen, people deserve a little bit of grace. That can't just hold when it's you. It has to apply to everybody. And if you're not going to apply it to everybody, then I don't think it should be applied to you. I think you should lose your job at that point. So it is it, it is obvious. True that, that if Whoopi Goldberg were a member of the right and she had said anything like this, her career would be over. Um, yep. But she's a member of the left, and that means that she's still useful to them. So they'll, they'll it, honestly, I think taking her off the air for a couple of weeks was a favor to her. They're figuring the news cycle will move on. Two weeks from now, she'll just go back on the air. Nobody will have noticed. She didn't have to do any sort of apology to her, right? She did one apology on the air. The other quasi apology she tried to make on Colbert, she doubled down on the actual message. She doesn't have to at any point explain what she meant by it. Normally, when you apologize for a thing, you actually have to explain what you meant by it or how your mind has changed now. She's not going to have to do any of that stuff. So they, they took her off the air for She They actually saved her. For, she, she's whining about it. But what they did for her was actually kind of a favor. They, mm. they got her off the hook. Nobody's expecting her to be fired now. And no one expects her to talk about this at length when she comes back. Well, you know who is sorry? Finally, we've we've actually heard an apology on day, what, five, four of the scandal, Stacey Abrams, without the mask, the, the worst picture ever. I mean, it's going to it's going to haunt her for the rest <laughs> of her political career, sitting in front of little kids like the, the least at risk from covid, uh, all of whom are masked, smiling brightly. Uh, and at first she, she tried to say first she said, I'm, this is a Republican made up attack on me. Uh, try to b- blame the evil GOP. Then she tried to say, I only took my mask off for one second for the photo, and I made sure they had their mask on. We're like, hello, that's the problem. Then now it comes out, um, I think it was OutKick reporting, uh, that it wasn't true. She had the mask off the entire time. All right, so she's, yeah. she lied about it. She did it. And that poster is just so emblematic, that picture of what the Democrats have been doing time after time after time. And rules for thee, but not for me. I think my favorite aspect of this is when the story immediately broke and her first move from her comms team was, of course, to blame (laughs) racism. That was that's always the first move. And then (laughs) that falls apart. And then she has to fire. the And then the next day, there's like a listing for her for her online team because they had posted the photo. That's the best part of this. She posted the photo, right? No one else posted the photo. She posted the photo, which is hysterically funny. And then she goes out and she apologizes for not holding by the rules. Now, the reality is the rule is stupid. Right. What you yes, should have said right. is I was unmasked because I'm vaxxed and because I'm clean. And these kids also should be unmasked because they don't need the masks in the first place. 
By the way, she would have been ahead of the other governors by like a day if that had happened. Mm-hmm. But instead, it was, no, you're right. I should, I should have worn the mask forever. And I'm really sorry this happened. Well, I just, I have doubts that this is the first time this sort of thing has happened off camera with Stacey Abrams. Because how many Democrats have to do this before you realize they just don't think the rules apply to them? And the excuses get ever and ever more silly. So we had Eric Garcetti, who took a, a photo unmasked next to Magic Johnson, unmasked. Magic Johnson is a 62-year-old overweight black man with HIV. <laughs> and Eric Garcetti is standing next to him unmasked. And he said, well, it's okay. I was holding my breath, which is really science-y. <laughs> Sounds like the science to me. And then you had Gavin Newsom. Apparently science-y. everyone in that in that Ram stadium had to take a picture unmasked with Magic Johnson. It was, it was by <laughs> California law. So Gavin Newsom did it then. And then he was like, yeah, but I had the mask on my hand, which makes sense because you breathe from your hand, right? That's, that's where all the particles come from. So that one was good. We had London Breed, the San Francisco mayor, who was out partying without a mask. And that was because the spirit moved her. Right? She took yeah, off the mask, which it. is, again, very science-y. Lot, lots of data and science going to the spirit moving her. You have Lori Lightfoot, who had to get a haircut. And then you had Nancy Pelosi, who also had, had to have a haircut. You had Kathy Hochul, who did it a couple months. Like, none of them abide by the rules, which That's says right. one of two things. Either they believe that they are so special that COVID will never hit them, and therefore the rules don't apply to them. Or they know the rules are bullcrap, and this is all just a method of control. And more importantly, of maintaining the illusion that they actually have the ability to control this thing. I think that so much of what this comes down to for the Democrats is that Joe Biden made a promise in 2020 that Democrats make about everything, and it is never fulfilled. And that promise is, I can give you anything you want so long as you give me all power. Joe Biden said, I will crush the virus. He never had the power to crush the virus. If he had never made that promise, he wouldn't be in trouble today. He would have just said, I did the best I could. Didn't work. We moved on. Right? That's what everybody else did. But once you make that promise, you are now ensconced in this. And so you know that it's not going to work, but maybe it'll work for all those dumb people, right? If we can just help a few dumb people not to die, then then all of it will have been worthwhile. And they're dumber than I am. After all, I'm a a prominent Democratic politician, which means I'm very smart. (laughs) Not unlike the deplorables. Ben, always a, a, such a pleasure. I love talking to you. And we want to reiterate now this. The film is called Shut In. It's going to post on YouTube tomorrow. So can people just watch it anytime tomorrow for free? I uh, know it's just on, so it's, it's one live stream. So 9 p.m. tomorrow night at the Daily Wire YouTube channel, one live stream to rule them all. And then the next day you have to go subscribe over at dailywire.com slash subscribe if you want to watch it. Okay, which you should do anyway. I'm subscribed. I love it. You can get all the content. You can get behind the scenes stuff. You can hear from Matt Walsh. You can hear from Candace. You can hear from Ben. They have fun little back and forths. Um, so anyway, well worth your time to subscribe. And by the way, love, love, love Morning Wire. It's a great podcast. We have to talk about whether Georgia Howe is real. I don't understand. She's like, is she real? Because she, like sometimes I'm like, I don't get it. I She can't be this measured in her tonal delivery. I want to see <laughs> proof of life. Uh, ben, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Great Don't forget, to to shut in. Shut in tomorrow uh, on Daily Wire's YouTube channel. So before we go, my team has told me that they put together a mashup of Justin Trudeau in, I don't know how we would describe it, but they I haven't seen it, and you and I are going to see it and hear it for the first time together. Here it is. I will never apologize for standing up for an LGDP, uh, LGT, LBT, LGBTQ <laughs> Two plus. And what do you and your family do to cut back on plastics? Uh, we uh, uh, we have uh, recently switched to drinking uh, water bottles out of uh, water out of uh, when we have water bottles uh, out of a uh, plastic. Uh, sorry, away from plastic towards uh, paper, um, like drink box water bottles, sort of things. I actually never take selfies. Oh. Everyone else takes selfies. I don't take selfies. Maternal love is the love that's going to change the future of mankind. So we'd like you to look uh, we, we like to say people kind, not necessarily mankind. If people want to wear a mask, uh, that is okay. It prevents you from breathing or, or, or speaking uh, moistly on them. Oh, what a terrible image. I appreciate calling it makeup, but it was blackface. <laughs> Have you since been made aware or remembered of other instances, and if so, how many? I am wary of of uh, being definitive about this. It is exactly the example of the kinds of things you need to do to counter the she, sesh, the she session and turn it into a she covering. I will never apologize. <laughs> she moistly speaking. Oh my God, please let, let that never happen between the two of us, he and I. Uh, that was amazing. Thank you, team. Well done. It was worth it. And don't forget to watch the show tomorrow because we've got Tony Robbins on the show. In the meantime, download the Megan Kelly show on Apple, Pandora, Spotify, or Stitcher and go to youtube.com slash Megan Kelly to subscribe. Thanks for listening. <laughs>